24 minutes past 10 o'clock. Uh, Joe Aldred on Chatback on BBC WM. Now, as I said to you a while ago, we're going to be talking about fatherhood. What's it like being a father, particularly a black father, in Britain today? Well, an event will be taking place uh, next week at the Custard Factory in Birmingham, looking at the issue of fatherhood. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, joining me in the studio to talk about this is Craig Pinkney, the event organizer. Good evening, Craig. Good evening. Craig. Lovely to have you on chat back tonight. Me too. First and time? Yes. First time, first time. All right. Well, let's let's, let's talk. Let's talk about the event. Um, the event, I believe, is, is called Fatherhood, um, not Fatherhood, not Fathers in the Hood. Uh, why the title and what's that about? I mean, I thought it was catchy in terms of the type of young people. It certainly is catchy. Um, type of the young people that I that we engage with. I thought it was catchy. I thought it was going to grip the eye in terms of practitioners that are that are interested in this type of, of work. And for those that are passionate about the issue of father deficit and trying to explore it, trying to understand it, um, and etc. So that's why I picked the title. Um, the inspiration came from one of my mentors, Raymond Douglas, um, who's quite... Um, quite well in this type of work and you know so it was it was definitely something that uh, we would try we used to, to attract the crowd um, and it kind of reflects the work that we're doing and know some of the um the work that we do in the community with gang members um young people that are affected by these particular issues so i think it kind of encompasses everything that we're all about now people of my age uh, age hear about the hood uh, what's the hood? I mean, the hood can be it can be translated to many things. Some people say the road, some people say the street. It's just a way of life, you know. People get up every morning, go to work. People get up every morning, do their their day to day activities. You know, it's just the environment in which people live. Um, so it's just a way of life. Um, people wake up in the morning, we've got things to do. You know, people describe it in many ways, using one particular word to say that's exactly what it means. Um, so people can say the hood, people can say the street, people can say my block, wherever we are. You <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, 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 it means different things, but to individuals that are coming from certain communities, they're all in consensus with, with what that sure. means. Sure, I mean, I've always assumed that it means, you know, our community, mm. where I come from. Uh, you know, my neighborhood is what I thought it was a play on. Am I getting close? Yeah, I mean, of course, of course, because I say that it's my hood. You know, I'm living in the community. My family are there. My friends are there. Everybody that I love, everybody that I care for is there. The young people I work with are in my neighborhood. So, yeah, it's my hood. <laughs> now you've made a documentary um, yeah. is it complete ready to complete, go? Complete ready um, and also will be screened on the 25th um, right. next Tuesday um, at the fatherhood event um, if I just tell you a little bit about it basically, yeah I was going to I was gonna ask you really what you what you discovered in, in making it well basically I started um, this work really I was engaging with a group of young people that um, traditionalist communities and statutory organizations labor these individuals as hard to reach, say they can't be engaged, don't know how to engage them. Well, I argue that they can be engaged, so we have to just engage with them completely different. So what I did was I, I went out into the community and I started engaging with these individuals that were labeled as hard to reach. And basic question I asked them, I said, well, I've got a two-year-old son. I'm a father myself. I've got a two-year-old son and I want to grow him up and I'm not leaving this hood and I'm not leaving this neighborhood. You know, so what can you teach him or what can you give me as inspiration that I can tell him so he doesn't end up like most of you guys, whether you're selling drugs, whether you're standing on the block, whether you've dropped out of school or college. Give me some information. Give me some advice that you can give me so I can tell him. I mean, in the beginning, a lot of them were, um, they didn't really like the theme because um, a lot of them felt that it was it was hypocritical for them to say um, some advice and I said no you individuals are the most powerful individuals that I want on this thing um, so what, when they, what sort of age were these uh, see this was yeah, ranging yeah. from the age of 14 15 up until 34 35 right. um, we got a range of different individuals that we was engaging with all of them most of them never had fathers um, most of them never had a, um, a male role model within the household. And you're asking them what is it like with. living there and what advice would they give you for a child so, yeah, now being brought up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hypothetical questions. And what were questions. some of their answers? I mean, it was brilliant. I mean, even before the question, I just wanted to just point out there was one individual that I was working with. And I said to him, tell me about your father. Tell me about your father. And he said, you know what? I don't really think about my dad. I don't really think about him. You know what? The only time I actually thought about my dad was when I got shot. And he came to the hospital and he asked my mom, am I okay? And then I thought to myself, is it because I got shot that he came out? 
or is, is it the possibility that you know you was interested in something else and for me that kind of struck a chord in my um in my soul so i said to him you know tell me so what would you what advice would you give and he said you know what if you ever become a father make sure you do the right thing make sure that you're doing the right thing for your kids and try and keep your family unit as strong as possible because a lot of them don't have those type of environments and they can see so what i did was engage with those people that you know, may have looked upon in the community for the negative reasons, yeah, yeah. negative um, reasons, and I thought these are the best people yeah. to, to be utilised. So we got some people on there that are incarcerated. They literally done a testimony before they went into prison. Some people have been stabbed. Um, also, all different issues have happened to these people in between the footage. So it's quite powerful to see um, these these young individuals getting on this and wanting to give back. Sometimes they don't know how to give back to the community. And how and keen are they? I, I'm just wondering, because uh, some people who live in tough circumstances, I mean, some people just bad mind and say, well, everybody should have it tough. But I, from what you're saying, these guys would like to see life different for other people. Most of them don't want their lives for themselves. Mm. And I think because a lot of them are in an environment where they don't know um, they don't know how to get out, they don't know how to exit, and those opportunities are not there for them to exit. Internally, they know that they don't want that for their young brothers, they don't want that for their uh, young sisters, you know, um, they don't want that for their, their younger friends, kids, and they, they don't want to see their mothers crying, you know, so... You know, that's, that was one of the main things that I started to hear from a lot of them. You know, in the beginning, as I said, a lot of them was quite hesitant towards it because they thought that the community as a whole would see them as hypocrites because people would watch and say, well, how come you're not taking that advice right, for yourself? Right. Etc. So a lot of them in the beginning was. But when I said to them, this is why I want you to tell my son, I want you to look into my eyes, my son's eyes and tell him, to stay off the road, stay in school, go to college, go to university, get your degree, because we don't want you standing on the streets like us. And how keen are they to get out? I know the advice is powerful for younger people coming up. Don't don't come here, uh, or don't do what I do. You know, do 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 right. I, I mean, I I remember a few years ago visiting a prison and talking to a young man who was in that prison. Yeah. He was only 21. Mm. Right, but he was already talking as though life had passed him by, and he said, "Listen, yo," <laughs> he said, "Minister, uh, don't bother with me." He said, "Talk to these little picking them in the school." That's what he was saying to me. Mm. So he'd actually written himself off already. You know, I was trying hard to say to him, "No, man, you're 21. You, life is ahead of you." H how are these people that you talk to in the documentary? Are they are they as committed and as keen to get? out of where they are to a better life or do they write themselves off now looking to the next generation i think we have to look at it in terms of their journey in terms of that little short 21 years you know a lot of them drop out of school a lot of them are presented with so many opportunities those get slammed in their face so a lot of them give up and a lot of them feel that these organizations or people in the community are not not helping them i mean we can look at it and from a position where i say well they need to help themselves and if i look at a particular example 13 young people wanted to go on an apprenticeship. All of them gang members involved in um, certain activities that me and you can't speak about right okay. now. Now, all of these guys wanted to um, get onto this apprenticeship. They all handed their CVs, they all signed. They said they don't want to go on, they don't want to, they want to come off the road and we want to do something positive. They all get slammed in their face because yeah. funding got pulled out and then they're left in the community and they're just like saying, see, because yeah. we want to do something. Yeah. So, it's all, so the way that I look at this is that most of them want to come out of this particular environment. A lot of them don't want to be on the streets doing these particular things, but they don't have the options. And unless we as practitioners and people as a in the community offer them, ways offer out. them the ways out yeah, yeah. and the alternatives, then the, a lot of them will still be standing on the streets and doing etc. etc. Explain briefly for me what you mean by the term um, father deficit. I mean... The way, the way that um, I, I understand father deficit and when I mean the word father deficit is, is the absence of the father. Right. So a young person growing up in, in, in whatever community and that father's not present, not only that the father might not be present in the household, but there's no physical conversation taking place with right. the a young person. Because most of the guys that we work with have a father in the household, but they don't have a relationship with their father. Mm -hmm. So when I'm talking about father absence, I'm talking about the, the, the absence of the individual mm -hmm. as a father or the role model in the household being removed from that environment. So what I'm looking at is individuals that don't have that in their environment and we're all about creating spaces so we can deal with that holistic healing before we can even focus on their criminality. This is powerful stuff, I must say. This is Joe Aldred on BBC WM talking to Craig Pinkney, who's, who has a, uh, just completed a documentary. It will be shown on the 25th of October next.